Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of Debatable with our hosts. I'm Nina. I'm Kyle. And for today, we're going to introduce the concept of genocide. So this is one of the, the more serious topics of this podcast. And the reason is because we think that it's an important topic to know about. Whether you're a debater, whether you're not a debater, if you're new or if you're um, someone who's been debating a while, it's one of the important concepts and discussions right now in the international community that is relevant even if you are not experiencing it yourself or even if you're not in a country that has this situation take place now. I think there's a lot of misconception as to what yeah. genocide is. Yeah, so the reason why we're making this episode yeah. is to dispel a lot of those. I remember my very first grand final back in 2013 or something and the motion was about crimes against humanity and our opening government was defining it as some just like a premeditated crime that uses a lot of resources and for me it was a pretty weird definition because like that, that applies to many different crimes and not necessarily crimes against humanity so yeah so we're going to introduce first what crimes against humanity are and then we're going to talk about genocide in in particular and then we're going to introduce some case studies as to what genocide looks like and what are like debatable definitions of genocide that we've seen in like recent months yeah right. so what what is a crime against humanity and what's the importance of having clear standards in the first place so remember in your debate right they had a very general definition so if it's not that what is it really a crime against, against humanity is basically an act deliberately committed as part of a widespread or systematic attack against any civilian population or part of that population. So um, this is different from a war crime, although like, a lot of people consider war crimes to be part of crimes against humanity and we treat them with the same level of like um, we, we treat them with the same level of frustration or outrage, etc. But the difference between a crime against humanity and a war crime is in a war crime you can only commit it during wartime. But a crime against humanity you can commit it during a peacetime as well. So um there's a case before, if I'm saying it was prosecutor versus Conorak that talked about the elements of a crime against humanity. So the first one is that there is an attack. The second element is that it must consist of acts of a person or entity that was accused and that person was part of the attack. And this is the third one, that, which is important, that the attack is directed towards a civilian population. So it doesn't matter where the civilian is from. So it, it just says against a civilian population. The protection extends to any civilian population, including your own population. So if, for example, a certain world leader commits a lot of indignities against a certain group of people, his own people, for example, like mm, immigrants, drug addicts, mm-hmm. for example, that could be considered as part of a crime against humanity. So but, it should be enough to show that enough individuals were targeted in the course of the attack that supposed to exist, right? And the attack was in fact directed against a civilian population rather than against a limited and randomly selected number of individuals. So it really had to be targeted, right? Yeah. So one of the problems here is that, and I'll get to this later, it's sometimes difficult to ascertain whether it was directed towards a population or just like random like incidents that just so happened to be statistically part of a certain population. Yeah, like a, a location that just so happened to be full of this particular indigenous yeah. group or or what. Yeah. The next element is that it has to be widespread or systemic. And I remember there was some debate as to what widespread meant or what systematic meant. But according to the International Red Cross commentary, basically they say that widespread means the large-scale nature of the attack. So we look at the number of victims or like the geographical scope of the attack. So Do they give a number? or um, No, uh, it's a case-to-case basis thing. So for example, if you have like a really small country, for instance... There could still like it's still example, widespread. Yeah, it's if, still widespread if it's like a certain like a large portion of that. So it's a okay, we we decide that on a case to case basis. It's something that you argue to a particular international tribunal. And as for systematic, what it means is it has to have some sort of level of organization or premeditation that's involved in the attack. So. It probably signifies like it has to be organized acts of violence and like the improbability of them being random. So lots of people will try to defend their governments saying it's probably just random. It's just statistics or whatever. It's not really a pattern. It has to be shown that it's completely improbable. Like really random, shall random. Yeah, and then the last one is mensury or like guilty mind. 
which basically says that there must be knowledge that the acts are unlawful and um, that they are part of a pattern, regardless if the pattern is widespread or systematic or both. So the test here is rational nexus. So, okay, rational nexus is sort of a difficult thing to understand. Basically, rational nexus is whether there's a reasonable link towards like the attack. So the offense, the crime, doesn't necessarily have to be like unlawful in itself. Um, it doesn't need to constitute the attack in its entirety. It can just be part of the attack. So if it is rationally or reasonably related to a particular attack, then it is part of um, it is part of the notion of mens rea. You need to be aware that it is unlawful and it's part of that pattern. Um, so it consists of a the commission of the act, which um, by its nature or consequences is objectively part of the attack, and also knowledge on the part of the accused that there is an attack on the civilian population. And so there had to be like a, a, a period of planning, a period of like steps that were yeah. taken. If you're able to prove that, then it's likely an act against humanity. Yeah. So for example, um, in the Rwandan genocide, it, it was proven that there was some level of premeditation, like a high level of premeditation because they got, um, if I'm not mistaken, they got they intercepted some radio transmissions that, oh. that were actually instructions to certain groups of people going like let's massacre this particular group of people. The next thing that we're gonna talk about is the like what constitutes a genocide mm-hmm. and the importance of the standard. So let me talk about the importance of the standard first. The the reason why it's important to have a clear standard for these kinds of things is Paradoxically, we had the Genocide Convention, which was created after World War II mm-hmm. as a response to the Holocaust. And everyone was like, yeah, this is this is great. So it's one of the most revered documents in, in the world, but it's also one of the most disregarded in recent times. So, for example, again, let's talk about Rwanda a bit, because that's other than the Holocaust, the Rwandan genocide seems to be one of the most popular yeah. or infamous genocides that there have been. Like, um, I was I was like 12 or something when... Someone first t- talked to me about, you know, about the Rwanda genocide, the Hutus and the Tutsi. So it's very infamous. Yeah. And in that instance, we had a lot of different countries that were trying to ignore um, the genocide convention or try to sidestep it. So the best example that I can think of right now is the Clinton administration. Um, so during the Rwandan genocide, what happened was um, Bill Clinton was specifically instructing um, his representatives to say acts of genocide might have occurred rather than genocide happen. So there, there's a lot of euphemizing going on. Like um, There's lots of semantic wizardry that they're yeah. trying to employ in order to remove their actions um, or actions of a particular group of people or administration from the scope of the genocide. Yeah, so, so the, I remember the language was a really big issue when it came to the Rwandan ge- genocide because the, the government never technically admitted that it, it occurred. And this is where you see like the relationship relationship of the government and media and how they're able to sort of sidestep the accusations by like making sure that all their published materials were not explicit enough to sort of accuse them yeah. of such. And then even today, you still see that in the Rohingya crisis in Myanmar. A lot of people are noting that Myanmar government categorically denies that this is genocide. Like they have their their propaganda machine, they keep using it, trying to sidestep the application of a genocide convention. Yeah. And also one of the most important reasons why, uh, one of the biggest reasons why it's important to have a clear standard is that since it's one of the worst crimes ever, like ever conceived of by humanity, it's like, like one of our darkest tendencies as a species, having a clear standard emphasizes its gravity. So... Like, you can't just accidentally commit genocide. You can't just, um, by virtue of negligence, commit genocide, right? So it it necessarily has to be evil. And having these standards sort of emphasizes that point. Yeah, and it it leads to harm if we have a tendency to just name every atrocious act as a genocide because then we don't actually emphasize acts that are genocide. We sort of, like, dampen the definition of the word if we just use it all the time. Yeah, so it's like, it's similar to the debates about calling people Nazis, like mm-hmm. comparing them to Nazis, comparing people to Marcos, for instance. Or we, Hitlers. Or Hitlers. Like, you remove the nuances, we sort of um, devalue, like, the importance of those historical events. But again, by, that's debatable, of course. Yeah, that, that's why I said similar to those mm-hmm, debates. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, um, so what really constitutes as a genocide? Um, the Genocide Convention says that genocide is any of the following acts committed with intent to destroy a national, ethnical, 
racial or religious group. And there's like a bunch of acts here. The first one is killing members of the group with the intent to do so. The other one is causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group. And, you know, as a commentary, I just want to say that it doesn't necessarily mean that the harm is permanent. So it could be torture, or inhumane or degrading treatment, it could be persecution, stuff like that. Anything that's basically haunting to this group or something that like sticks with them, something that like affects them in the long term. Yeah, so it's usually like a catch-all. So the first app is killing members of the group. What if it's short of killing members of the group, but it's really, really bad anyway? It's still part of genocide. Mm-hmm. So I remember, and this is one of the reasons why I was even talking about this, a lot of people seem to think that if we're talking about genocide, it necessarily means that you have to kill a bunch of people. But that's not true. Um, you can even just widespread systematic torture could be considered genocidal, right? And one of the other acts is deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about physical destruction in whole or in part of that national, ethnic, racial, or religious group. So this involves like starving them. So you're not actually committing direct harm against them, but you're like indirectly getting there, like the depriving them of basic necessities, those kinds of things. So even if you don't kill them, like initiating processes that eventually will kill them in the long run yeah. or in a few days or weeks is yeah. genocide in itself. Yeah, there, there's also um, imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group. So it's not it's not like you directly harming them. It's harming the group as a whole and their ability to propagate, spread, or to like just reproduce in general. Yeah, like so, limiting their numbers. Anything that attempts to limit their numbers is also an act of genocide. Yeah, so like theoretically, a one-child policy that's mm-hmm. imposed only on this group could be considered genocide. Sexual mutilation, sterilization, forced birth control, the separation of sexes, those kinds of things. In fact, I would argue that having someone not from that group, like making them rape a woman and so that group is no longer pure, for example, that counts as as genocide. And um, there's also some other things like forcibly transferring children of the group to another group, etc. So I think an important thing to note here is that when we talk about genocide, it doesn't necessarily mean that there is actual extermination of the group. So it just means that once any, not all, just any, just one of them, of the above acts, of the acts that we just talked about are committed with the intent to destroy in whole or in part the group, then it's genocide. If you try to push them away or like persecute them, that is also considered genocide. Mm -hmm. If it has a special intent. And this is one of the other elements. Special intent to destroy in whole or in part the group. So... Okay, what's the summary? There are three elements to genocide. The first one is the act. The next one is there must be a group, the presence of a group. It has to be national, ethnic, racial, or religious. The last one is the presence of an intent. So let's take a look at the case study. The most recent one that for me is like just not debatable at all at this point. I mean, at some point it might have been debatable. It it was before, yeah. But right now I don't think it is. I mean, for me, it's sort of set in stone. The Rohingya crisis is... Like, most definitely to me, genocide. So the, the first one is sort of obvious. You have killings, you have acts, you have systematic killings. Like, tens of thousands of people in September 2017 were killed. Yeah. You created around 700,000, I think, or more refugees as a result of those killings. So that's one of the acts. Another one is imposing conditions of life that are calculated to bring about physical destruction. And this is where I want to talk about things like they're prevented from basic livelihood activities, they're prevented from engaging in commerce, getting professions. In a lot of instances, they're even prevented from getting clean water, sanitation, health services, those kinds of things. So I think it's obvious that those are conditions of life that are specifically calculated to bring about the destruction. Yeah, that's why it was important to note earlier that they doesn't they don't need to exterminate the group per se for it to be genocide. I remember that was one of the main defenses that the Myanmar government used. Like they had no awareness that it would lead to the destruction of this group in the long term. But they were already taking like premeditated steps that would ensure the, their extermination in the long term by depriving them, by mutilating them, by ensuring they don't get any economic benefit that would basically like lead them to poverty, right? Yeah. And I also think that the one of the acts that we mentioned earlier, the prevention of births, uh, also applies here. Because there's a policy there that's imposed by the military government. They basically can't have more than two children. And for me, that's just clearly like a prevention of births. 
Um, the next element here, and this is one of the more disputed ones, especially with regard to what Myanmar is saying, the existence of a group. So under the Genocide Convention, it has to be a national, ethnical, racial, or religious group. And according to the Myanmar government, they're not any of these things. They're not a recognized group, um, according to the Myanmar government. Actually, the military has worked for a really long time to rewrite history and say that they're not actually a minority group. They're not even a legitimate national ethnic group. In fact, like if you want to become a citizen in Myanmar, you need to be part of these particular races. And Rohingya is not part of those races that are enumerated. So they're not even citizens. Instead, they're being treated as illegal immigrants. So you call them like Bengali, mm-hmm. etc. So it's the same at the immigration stances, which just... It's just focused more using religion. Because like when, when we think about um, the Rohingya crisis, we think about, oh, Buddhists versus Muslims. But it's also like a political, secular dispute over whether or not they're legitimate migrants or whether or not they're illegal immigrants. Yeah, so they were trying to get away with semantics. But even the act of semantically declaring them as non-citizens and declaring them like basically lesser in the hierarchy is in and of itself discrimination. Yeah. Right, which just makes it more likely that all their intended acts are not from a place of lack of intent or like it being random. Yeah. It's still targeted. Yeah, and for me, I, like Myanmar is literally alone in this denial. Like no one else is denying that they are citizens. Yeah. And, uh, not not citizens, but like a, a group, an, an ethnic group. And I think we shouldn't even be taking a look at the standards of the accused country, like the, the, the offending country. I don't think that their standards are the one that we should be using. Because in fact, the, the Rohingyan people do have self-identification, identify as Rohingyans. So I think like there is a moral dilemma here. Because if we allow Myanmar to use their own definition, then essentially what's happening is like offending countries get to decide whether or not they violate the geni- the Geneva whether or not they violate the genocide convention because if in another case like they can just say oh they're not actually we don't recognize them as a particular group then they just escape accountability mm-hmm. I think a better way to look at it is from the perspective of the victim like if the victim considers themselves to be part of a group then that's the perspective that we should be taking as the international community or as debaters yeah so so pretty clear cut this case study. The next case study I want to discuss is something that's still being debated right now. Actually, it's a very recent topic. I actually like set this as a motion in PIDC 2019 along with my fellow Ashkar members. And the motion was technically about Canada's decision to label the murder of its indigenous children and women as genocide. So the motion was about regretting Canada's decision to describe the disappearances as genocide. And this is where the definitions sort of become murky, right? Because like what you'll notice here is the lack of clear intent, nor the proof that attacks actually took place. So the public inquiry into the deaths and disappearances of thousands of indigenous women was one of Trudeau's first acts after becoming prime minister of Canada in 2015. So he did acknowledge that something horrible happened to these groups. So the reports found that 1,017 homicides of indigenous women between 1980 and 2012 were committed which was five times higher than the homicide of non-Indigenous women. So this is where they claim it's targeted because statistically it was just more targeted towards the Indigenous women versus other groups. There were also 164 disappearances, particularly of children and women, but mostly children. And reports claim that there may have been more that were undiscovered. So the reason that this became like sort of labeled as a genocide was because acts were committed that were horrible. They, they, were, they were murdered and basically ended up disappearing. And like more or less, they claim it's very targeted. The reports then found that in terms of actions, there were police inactions when these things were taking place. Basically, the police was turning a blind eye to the disappearances of the news groups because they claimed them not to be worthy of their time or resources. Second, there were cycles of intergenerational violence. So it's not just one generation that faced this. It was everyone from that indigenous group that like more or less faced like oppression from yeah, the, for thirty years. Yeah. For thirty years for from the police, etc. And there were failed government policies that have broken families and locked indigenous peoples into poverty. So they didn't have many resources, more or less. They had a harder time getting jobs. 
they had a harder time like getting into good homes or acquiring the basic services that government should provide regardless of your group and ethnicity. So more or less, they claim this is targeted. The question now is, is this considered genocide? Especially since there was really no like deliberate step or process, but Canada claims it's a genocide. One of the debates is, is this just like negligence? Is this just like plain old homicide? Can you consider it like targeted enough and widespread enough and systematic enough for it to uh, like deserve the label of being a genocide? Yeah, so obviously the, the group aspect is already there. Like it's clearly identified their indigenous children and women. But my question is, there are lots of disappearances, murders. Who committed those? The, the, the police, like the inactions of governments, right? Mm. Um, so this is where they don't know where what which party is acting on it. Right, reports are unclear. It could have just been like the, the reports by the time I'm not sure of the updates now personally, but by the time I did this research, like they weren't very sure yet of who mm. it could have been just like random people murdering and targeting like indigenous people. But the police were definitely involved due to their inaction. Right. They have, for example, like deprived, they have been more prone to torture and been harsher to these groups. So the government more or less is at fault. Like that's what people's claim people are claiming. That's what gov- the government of Canada is willing to claim about themselves. Yeah, so um, for me, there are now two questions here. First is inaction, part of the act considered in the Genocide Convention as to what constitutes genocide. And second, whether or not it, there's intent like to destroy that group. Yeah, but but there's also like a lot of arguments you can run to claim that this is a genocide. Because, for example, the Canadian government sought to, quote-unquote, cause Aboriginal people to cease to exist as district, legal, social, cultural, religious, and racial entities in Canada through the use of like, killing children in the schools, physical and sexual abuse, etc. Like the government admitted to that? Um, research has shown, and the reports that were done by international bodies have claimed that the actions and laws of Canada make it more likely that Indigenous people were targeted. Mm, I see. Yeah, so for me, since the debate is again about negligence, I think government has to answer whether or not, like even if it were negligence, can that be considered genocide? Yeah. Because for me, I think it's arguable because you can be deliberately inactive, you can be deliberately negligent. And like, the thing about negligence is, as opposed to like any other crime, if you're negligent, you didn't have an intent to kill, for example, but there's still intent there. It's just the intent to be negligent. Yeah, but we're not sure. That's the hard part right maybe they were just like del- like accidentally under prioritized maybe there was not a lot of research from the government's end on the needs and particular nuances of these groups but like the, the conclusion of the reports was basically that the indigenous communities were under prioritized and under resourced which is semantically very different from active deprivation right Mm-hmm. So this is yeah. like one of those very murky ways that the term genocide comes into play. Because more or less the outcomes were the same, more or less like the, 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 the group was targeted, right? But was there a systematic and deliberate intention to cause them to cease existence? Yeah, so the, the main arguments here are that you regret it, we regret um, describing it as genocide because it devalues actual genocide. Um, it, it isn't even really genocide. We're just jumping the gun so we can sensationalize the issue. Yeah. Yeah. And so uh, Andrew Skier, the head of the Conservative Party, actually avoids the word genocide and just claims it's a tragedy, but it doesn't fall under genocide because we didn't know it would lead to this. We had no intentions of harming them. We just accidentally deprioritized them and g- gave them like very minimal resources. Which is horrible, but mm. but you know, given how the law was structured and how the convention took place, like the standards are high. So it brings about the question if it's not a genocide and like I'm more likely to believe like technically speaking it isn't because it lacks the, the clear, invisible intent. What do you call it? Right? It's more or less genocide anyway. And that's the debate. Maybe it's about time we redefine what genocide is and intention shouldn't matter. Because if that's the standard, it's very easy for other governments, like what Myanmar tried to do, which is like, say, we didn't mean to, we didn't know it would happen. So should yeah. genocide focus on intent or outcome more? And that's like the real question. Yeah. So a part of the debate could be, yeah, okay, fine. Even if it doesn't fall under the current standards for what genocide is, that doesn't mean that we can't change 
what genocide should be about. Like, this is about a reassessment of what genocide is supposed to be considered. And, yeah. like, the Genocide Convention was created, like, decades and decades ago. So maybe we should make it evolve to be more accommodating towards the current times. Yeah, but that's an, another problem that's raised. Because if we are going to redefine genocide to include instances like this, then it applies to all indigenous groups that are under... like Underfunded. Underfunded, um, not given enough protections. Like, a lot of Native Americans... Um, in in the U.S. and the borders of U.S. and Canada face the same experience. So would you consider that a genocide? Or even if we apply it locally in the Philippines, like or like the indigenous groups in Mindanao are not funded enough, and it has led to them like yeah, systematically the being in poverty. Is that a form of genocide? So that's like the the crux of the debate, and it leads to a lot of like slippery slopes of like other countries being now accused of genocide. Right. So I think the, the real conclusion to this is like we, we need to probably go back to that convention, like redefine it, reassess, because the changing times means that actions can now change. There are yeah. now a lot of ways for you to deprive groups that are not in, in the form of war or yeah. like deprivation, right? Oh, how about how about the context in the Philippines? Not indigenous groups, although it's very important. I I, feel, I just feel like you already covered a lot of that. How about the drug war in the Ooh. Philippines? Is that genocide? Because for me, technically, it isn't. Because let's like. Who is the group here? Like, of course, there is obviously intent to destroy, like, this group. Like, drug addicts, for example, or the poor. But, but they're not ethnic yeah, or religious. Yeah, but are they national, ethnic, racial, or religious? Yeah. So for me, I don't think it is genocide. What I think might be the case is that it's a crime against humanity. Because there's obviously an attack against an identifiable part of the civilian population. So definition of a crime against humanity is much broader so you can you can consider it to be um drug users drug pushers drug addicts for example that's an identifiable part of the civilian population yeah and the attack exists we also know that the Duterte administration is part of the attack and like it's clear for me it's clear um and it is directed against them it is widespread it is systematic you have um talk hands everywhere um and for me i think that there was knowledge that there is an attack yeah, of course. But what might be debatable here, I don't like saying that it's debatable, but maybe... Legally speaking. Legally speaking, it might be difficult to prove that like there was knowledge that it was unlawful. Like there was knowledge that it was part of a pattern. Like the, there was knowledge that this is a crime against humanity. I, I suppose like these people are saying this is within our rights as a government. We're just exercising our police power. Um, we That's didn't actually yeah. do extrajudicial killings, etc. Uh, well, yeah, so, <laughs> yeah, so for me... It is not that debatable. What I I would I would say is that it's not genocide in my opinion, but it might be a crime against humanity. Maybe that because um, maybe the reason for that is because when the genocide convention was made, they didn't take into consideration like economic identities. Right, so I, I'd say before the the gap between the rich and the poor, it was easy to cross over. Right, the American dream was alive. Like it was the rise of globalization. People from could go from rags to riches. But as of now, if you're born poor, you're likely to stay there. So it becomes very strong as an identity. So I would argue if we were to redefine genocide, we should probably take into consideration like economic stances and economic like standings of people and like consider that an identifiable yeah. like way to categorize people well I, I would also say that you can you can relate this to the not the genocide convention man. it's the geneva conventions and their additional protocols mm. because if you remember um one of the elements of a crime against humanity is that it must be against a civilian population and the civilian the term civilian population is a technical term so it's not just over civilians it is a reference to to the geneva conventions and I don't want to go into detail about that. Maybe maybe another episode. <laughs> yeah, but what I will say is that definitely the Geneva Conventions might be read in conjunction with this. And since 
your, your topic, uh, what you were talking about earlier was when the genocide convention was formed, people didn't think about um, economic status. Economic sta- status. But I think there might be an argument with the current body of law, that, body of knowledge we have that's called international law that might be able to say that it did take into consideration economic mm-hmm. standing. Maybe. Because in the additional protocols of the Geneva Convention, if I'm not mistaken, it's Common Article 3, um, where it, it applied to um, in con- armed conflicts of non-international character. Um, it basically said that one of the rights of people, parties to the conflict is um, the right against adverse distinction. And the right against adverse distinction is basically that you have a right against being discriminated based on, and this is exactly what they said, race, color, religion, faith, sex, birth, or wealth. Ooh. So even under the Geneva Conventions, clearly you can't discriminate people based on their wealth. So I, I, in my opinion, it just means that there is a there is already a long-standing notion that people can be identified based on their economic status. They shouldn't be given adverse distinction based on that fact. If that's the case, then there is a strong argument to, to, to run saying that the acts committed in the Philippines probably can be identified as genocide if we take it in conjunction with the other yeah. Geneva Conventions. Yeah. All right. That was pretty lengthy, but I, I think it was important to talk about all that. We introduced like a lot of case studies, more than we actually prepared for. I think yeah. it was interesting. Uh, we got carried away. We're very sorry. But again, I, I think it's very important to discuss this because you may not feel it, but genocide may be happening around us. What's important is like we have to take people, in, like, we have to hold people accountable. For the things that they do, basically. So in order to do that, we need to know what exactly they're doing and what those things mean. So if we see a bunch of acts or policies that tend to do a certain thing against a certain group of people, then you have to start questioning, is this is this just like business as usual or is this part of like this bigger, like even worse, more evil um, tendency? Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know how to end this on a positive note. It, it's... It's sad uh, what we've come to and how people have tried to get away with semantics. But it's also important to know what those semantics are. So that's it for this episode. Thanks for listening. Bye. Thanks for listening.